Good morning, everyone. This is Ruth Samara, the Director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence. I want to thank you for joining today's video conference that will provide highlights of the recently released manual, Sharing Confidential Mental Health and Addiction Information in Ohio, Mental Health and Addiction Providers and Law Enforcement, and give participants an opportunity to ask questions of attorney Christina Shanek Diaz, who authored the manual. Before I introduce Christina, I wanna provide some logistical information about the video conference and brief background information on our Center of Excellence as well as this current project. So this conference is scheduled for one hour. There are over 100 participants in the conference representing a variety of disciplines. So because of the size of the group, all participants in the conference except for the speaker and the host site have been muted. Participants have submitted some questions in advance, which Christina will try to incorporate into her 15 to 20 minute presentation, and then additional questions will be welcomed and encouraged at the close of that presentation. Questions can be submitted via the chat bar at the bottom of your screen, assuming that you're joining us by computer. You may need to hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen to bring up the chat bar. We are recording today's session and will release information at a future date, likely mid-September, about how to access this meeting. The Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence is hosting today's conference as part of the Justice Mental Health Collaboration Program expansion grant that we share with the Office of Criminal Justice Services and the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. The actual creation of the manual was funded through SAMHSA block grant dollars awarded to our center by the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So most of you are familiar with the criminal justice CCOE, but real briefly, let me make note that it was created in 2001 to encourage communities throughout Ohio to forge collaborative relationships between the mental health and criminal justice systems so that individuals with mental disorders receive the care they need. The center serves as the Crisis Intervention or CIT Technical Assistance Center for Ohio, offers sequential intercept cross-systems mapping for both adult and juvenile mental health and opioid responses, and provides technical assistance across the intercepts for these interface areas. So for many years, we have been fielding questions and concerns regarding difficulties exchanging meaningful and helpful but lawful releases of protected health information between the justice and mental health systems and misunderstandings about HIPAA and other applicable laws. A couple of years ago, we asked attorney Christina Shanak Dias to present to the body of attendees at the Ohio CIT Advanced Training Conference on the issue of disclosure of protected health information between law enforcement and mental health. And that presentation led to discussions about the need for a document that crosswalks the applicable state and federal laws and regulations that affect meaningful information exchange. Because of the saturation of CIT in Ohio and the frequently asked questions by law enforcement officers on this issue, we decided to start at the beginning with Intercept 1 and create a manual section by section to address the exchange of protected health information between these systems, and Christina agreed to coordinate and author the manual. So this manual, which is the first in what will be a series of manual sections, has so far been very well received. Um, in fact, we were asked to provide it to the Council of State Governments Justice Center as an example for other states and already received a request from Oklahoma City um, for it and have honored that request. And most recently, we were informed that the manual has been made available as an additional resource for the updated Peace Officer Basic Training Lesson Plan at the Ohio Peace Officer Training Commission through the Ohio Attorney General's Office. So on that note, we're grateful for the opportunity to work with Christina on this project, and I want to introduce her so that she can get to the content that you're all here to hear about. So Christina Shanek Dias is a licensed attorney. She earned her Juris Doctor, Master of Social Work, and Bachelor of Arts degrees from The Ohio State University. She's currently a sole practitioner specializing in behavioral health law, public agency compliance issues, and state and federal confidentiality laws. Um, prior to starting her own practice, she was the Chief of Legal Affairs and Policy Development for the Ohio Association of County Behavioral Health Authorities. You know that as a WACABA. Um, she was there for five years, and in that role, she advised the association on legal matters, addressed legal issues from the association's membership, 
developed informational materials and gave presentations on confidentiality laws, sunshine laws, ethics laws, and other issues related to compliance with state and federal laws by Ohio's behavioral health boards. She also assisted the boards in the initial development and implementation of the HIPAA regulations, as well as with ongoing compliance issues. Additionally, she was the Awakaba representative for various state level initiatives and work groups related to confidentiality and also worked closely with the Ohio Departments of Mental Health and Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services to assist Ohio's public behavioral health system in confidentiality law compliance. And there's a little bit more pertinence to her background regarding um, her, you know, early work in the, as a social work intern in the residential treatment center at the Orient Corrections Reception Center, as well as some work with ODRC Legal Services and the Columbus City Prosecutor's Office. But I wanna hand this off to Christina so she can get us started. She's got some PowerPoint slides and we will also be, I believe, toggling back and forth between that and the document that you're all here to learn more about. So Christina, in your hands. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am going to attempt to share my screen here. So hopefully, hopefully everybody can see that. Ruth, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Very good. Okay. Um, as Ruth mentioned, there's been a great level of interest in this manual and just by all of you joining today, um, we can see that there is quite an interest in this information. It's been very exciting um, how well it's been received so far. And it shows that we're all just trying to figure this stuff out and improve our interactions and assistance to persons with mental illness and substance use disorders. So for today, what I would like to do is start off with um, an overview Sorry about that, trying to get my screen where you can see it the best. Okay, I wanted to start off with the purpose of this manual, and this is what I kept in mind as I approached drafting this manual, deciding how to structure it and how to draft it. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is simplify the application of the confidentiality laws. I'm sure all of you know, no matter what your level of exposure and work with the confidentiality laws is, um, they're complicated and there's multiple ones and how they interrelate can be difficult, um, not to mention understanding each one in and of itself. So wanted to try to simplify those laws wanted to provide a common understanding both within the behavioral health system and in the law enforcement community. Um, of course, we want to facilitate information sharing uh, between the criminal justice system and the behavioral health systems with this manual. Um, we address some of the common scenarios that I heard prior to that CIT conference that Ruth talked about, that I've heard since then, that our experts that helped review the manual brought up. So hopefully those are some of the common scenarios you've encountered as well and will be helpful to you. Um, in the appendix, which I'll go through, we provided some tools and resources. So beyond just explaining all of this, some things you can hopefully actually use and refer back to. And then, of course, the overarching intent of all this is to ultimately improve the assistance that both systems are providing to persons with mental illness and substance use disorders. So that's kind of how I frame this in my mind when I started drafting this manual. I'd like to um, move through a bit of an overview of the manual. I don't know if everybody's had an opportunity to review it yet. I think it was sent out with the announcement for this conference. Um, it starts with the first section summarizing the confidentiality laws. You know, there's a lot packed into the regulations. So I started off with simply summarizing, I say simply, but probably not, um, as succinctly as possible, summarizing who's covered by each of the confidentiality laws, HIPAA and the um, Federal Drug and Alcohol Addiction Confidentiality Law 
shorthand, of course, for that is 42 CFR Part 2, and I'm just going to refer to it as Part 2 as we move forward because the, the federal law itself is a mouthful. Um, so I talk about who's covered on the first couple pages of the manual under HIPAA and under Part 2, and then I talk about the information that is covered. After I kind of lay the groundwork for each of those laws, I moved into the law enforcement specific piece of each of the laws. I laid out um, what information HIPAA permits to be exchanged with law enforcement, and albeit limited, the information that part two allows to be um, disclosed by part two pro programs to law enforcement. I also added a section in there about other ways information can be shared um, outside of the explicit disclosures, some um, recommendations for other ways information can be shared. And when we get to the highlights, I'm gonna talk about that one a bit more. I then have a section on recommendations. We're taking all of that into consideration, how, it apply, how these laws apply, what can be shared, recommendations for mental health and addiction providers and law enforcement to exchange information the best they can when they need to in a way that complies with these laws. And basically my recommendations in a nutshell are um, communication between the systems, collaboration between the systems, and both of those occurring in a proactive way. You don't wanna wait until an individual is in a crisis situation on the street to figure out how you can share information. You wanna figure this stuff out as best you can ahead of time, have the systems communicate and figure out from a proactive approach how to address situations that commonly arise moving forward between the two systems. The next section of the manual are those common scenarios I talked about. And some of these came from trainings I've provided. Uh, some have come from our reviewers of the manual. Um, various areas of the behavioral health system, the criminal justice system, where I have heard these issues come up the most. I have a mental health providers and law enforcement section, an addiction providers and law enforcement section, and it's set up in like an FAQ type format. And I'm hoping that area of this will be the most helpful to each of you. Um, and it's probably something we can supplement in the future. These, these laws change from time to time. We're gonna have to update um, this manual at some point at that time. If there's any um, glaring omissions in the scenarios, hopefully we can add those at a later time as well. And then the last section of the manual are resources. Um, in those resources, I included the text of the regulations. Um, Regardless of how complicated it, they really are, the, per, the pertinent part for our purposes are really only a few pages long each. Um, that's it, three columns per page, but still just a few pages each. Um, I recommend you go through and read it. Even if some of it doesn't make the most sense to you, there will be areas that do. Um, and I think it will help give you a better understanding of these laws and, and that's both for the behavioral health providers that are subject to it and for law enforcement to get a, a better understanding of what it is the providers are responsible for complying with when they disclose information. This section also has some sample forms. I'm going to talk about those forms in the highlights section next and then it's um, got some additional details about each of these laws, um, some additional guidance materials, and I'll talk about those. I'm moving through this uh, portion rather quickly because I do want us to be able to get to the questions. I think that's what's going to be the most helpful. Um, so I'm going to move on to pointing out some highlights, some pieces of the manual that I think would be most helpful and some things that I think really need to be understood um, as a base level of um, uh, pretty much understanding all of this. Um, 
So the first highlight I want to point out is that most of the sections have important considerations at the end. At the end of each section, there's a heading that says important considerations. That's where I tried to include additional information that goes beyond the language of the regulations and into more of an explanation or major points to understand. And I tried to put those in um, layperson terms. Um, so if everything you're reading from the regulations seems like gobbledygook, look at the additional information section and see if it helped flesh it out a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to switch over to the manual itself now. Um, so you have an idea of that. So this is the 42 CFR part two specific section and under important considerations here, I think these are some really core pieces to understand. HIPAA is rather straightforward in terms of the disclosures that can be made to law enforcement. Those are listed in a previous section. Part two gets a little more tricky, so I wanted to just point out a couple things here. Um, these top few bullet points, the exceptions to 42 CFR Part 2's authorization requirement are much more limited than under HIPAA. Under HIPAA, there's a laundry list of what HIPAA covered providers can disclose to law enforcement. If you're talking about a drug and alcohol program, an addiction program, those um, exceptions are much more limited. So I wanted to start off with that. Um, and as it says in the second bullet point, 42 CFR Part 2 overrides other laws. It trumps HIPAA, it trumps state law, um, it even trumps disclosures that are authorized or required to be made under other state and federal laws. And the example I have here in this um, smaller bullet point, um, I think is the best way to highlight what that means, um, as most of you know, Ohio law requires the reporting of felonies. If you're aware that a felony has been committed, you're required to report it. HIPAA has a required by law exception. So if you're a health care, if you're a mental health provider, physical health provider, and you know a felony has been committed, um, Ohio law requires the reporting of those felonies, therefore you're allowed to report it under HIPAA. Part two does not contain a similar exception without the authorization of the person. So even though state law requires reporting of felonies, part two protected programs, those drug and alcohol addiction programs, are only permitted to disclose that information if it doesn't contain any part two protected information. And as you'll see in the manual when you dive into it, Part two protected information includes information that identifies a person as receiving substance use disorder services or having um, a substance use issue. So if information could be disclosed, for example, under this, and that gets into the next bullet point, if part two requires a person's authorization for a particular disclosure and HIPAA does not, if you can strip out the part two protected information, the SUD information, the piece that identifies a person as receiving SUD services, you can go ahead and make that disclosure under HIPAA. You've essentially stripped out the very restrictive uh, protections of part two, and then you're just releasing this information under HIPAA. That's just one particular piece of all this I wanted to emphasize because it can be very helpful to um, providers in disclosing information to law enforcement. Strip out the SUD part if you are able to and disclose the information um, as permitted under HIPAA. I'm gonna go back to the slide here. In addition to those uh, important considerations piece, um, please note that on page 15, I talk about what is not protected. It's important to note, it, to note um, 
that this really is pertaining to providers, law enforcement, they're not required to comply with these regulations. Um, there are other um, exceptions such as court journal and court docket entries, they're accepted under these laws. Um, general advice that providers can share um, with law enforcement when an officer calls because they're um, with somebody in a crisis situation and they call a mental health provider or a drug and alcohol provider, it might not always be necessary for that provider to disclose the protected information to the officer. They can provide general professional advice, how to de-escalate a situation, um, how to assist that person. Um, and then the, the officer can provide contact information for that individual and uh, the provider can follow up um, with that person whether they've been engaged or have not been engaged. So pay attention to what is not protected. Um, as I mentioned already, I have the text of the regulations in here. I recommend um, you, you read through those. Um, there's also a release of information form. I'm going to switch over to the guide itself. I believe on page 29 is where our appendix starts. Yes. So there's the regulations. If I can work my way down to the first form, this is an authorization for the exchange of confidential information. It's referred to as a consent for disclosure, a release of information, an authorization for exchange, all getting at the same thing. When you're not permitted to disclose information under these laws, you need the authorization of the person that's the subject in the, of the information. And even though the goal of this manual is to allow the sharing or to explain when the sharing of protected information is permitted to maximize, maximize that sharing, sometimes it comes down to an authorization of the person is needed. So I included in here a sample authorization form. If you notice at the top, it's a multi-party authorization form. So you can have, uh, disclosure doesn't always have to be from organization A to Officer B, there can be um, a mental health provider, substance use provider, an officer, whomever, a court on here. Um, you could add additional lines if more than three person, three organizations or people um, are being authorized to disclose information. This form, I won't go into the details of it, but it complies with HIPAA, Ohio MOSSES, the Ohio Department of mental health and addiction services requirements, and 42 CFR part two requirements. It has everything that each of those laws require for a release of information. So if somebody other than a mental health or addiction provider wants to get a person's authorization so they can get information from a provider, this form can be used knowing that it includes what those providers require be included on a release of information form. I also want to mention that right now in the state rule clearance process, there is a standard release of information moving through the uh, rule review process. And what that's intended to do is to provide for Ohio a standard release of information that the form itself is incorporated into Ohio law that can be used by any entity to obtain the authorization of a person to release their protected health information. And the law states that if a provider is presented with that form, they have to release the information listed on the form accordingly. They're required to. That form um, is gonna be probably the most beneficial to the criminal justice system. Um, like I said, it, it, information has to be disclosed pursuant to it. So if a court or a police officer is the one 
having the, the person sign the authorization for disclosure, a provider has to disclose the information listed. Um, that Keep in mind, that is only a um, two-way exchange of information form. Um, it has two parties, whereas this, um, as I mentioned, this sample form in here allows you to add additional parties. So if you need an a, additional party listed on the exchange, you might wanna use something more like this form than the one that is um, going to be in state law, but keep an eye out for that. Hopefully within the next couple months, it will become law. Um, it is being promulgated under the Ohio Department of Medicaid statute and rules. So if you wanna look it up, look under their um, pending, their draft rules, if you want to um, find it and review it. And I think the public comment period is still open on that. The next document in the reference section is intended to pr provide an overview of HIPAA's rather complicated requirements for responding to a subpoena. Um, I hear about this one from providers frequently. Um, I want to point out that this is HIPAA specific. A subpoena does not permit or authorize disclosure of substance use disorder information by a Part 2 program. This is for HIPAA only. Um, and it's kind of a connect the dots of laws when you can disclose information pursuant to a subpoena under HIPAA. So I drafted this document to kind of work you, to help you work through if all of the requirements have been met before you as a mental health provider disclose information pursuant to a subpoena. I also wanna point out at the top here, it says non-judicial subpoenas. A subpoena coming from a court or an administrative proceeding, a judicial subpoena, doesn't require anything else. This is for those non-judicial subpoenas that providers frequently get, from what I hear, um, from attorneys um, for their client or opposing their client in some type of proceeding or litigation. Um, you would have to walk through these steps, and I'm not going to go through them today, today, to make sure that it is acceptable to disclose uh, information pursuant to that subpoena. The last resource document is an administrative request for protected health information that a law enforcement official can give to a HIPAA-covered provider. If you look in the laundry list of HIPAA permitted disclosures to law enforcement at the beginning of the manual, you'll see that one way uh, a mental health provider can disclose information to law enforcement is if a law enforcement official provides an administrative request for the protected health information that includes certain criteria. That's great to have that option, but I frequently hear what's an administrative request um, from providers, what needs to be on there from law enforcement officers. So this is a sample form. Please note that this is nothing that is required to be utilized under HIPAA. It does meet the requirements HIPAA has for a law enforcement official's administrative request. So mental health providers, if a law enforcement official provides you with this form that has this information listed on it, you are authorized under HIPAA to disclose information to that requesting officer. And it specifically lists on there that um, uh, when that information can be disclosed, the manual lists what the de definition of law enforcement official is, and it talks about this being um, a request that has to assist law enforcement in the performance of their duties, um, not just because they're they might be interested in the status of a person. It's when they're actually performing their investigative duties or otherwise their official duties for which they need information. That's the purpose of this form. Going back to the presentation, I want to get to the submitted questions. We had some questions 
submitted prior to uh, today's presentation, and I wanted to address all of those. Keep in mind, there's a lot of material in this manual. There's a lot of hypothetical situations out there and actual situations out there to which this information applies. Um, we won't cover everything today, even when we open it up for questions. All of this could be full day trainings um, in and of themselves, each section could be. So I'll start with the submitted questions and they are questions that I hear frequently outside of the creation of this manual and then we'll open it up for questions. The first um, submitted question is exactly what is a 42 CFR Part 2 protected program, which is a program, a provider that has to comply with the federal drug and alcohol um, addiction confidentiality law. I spell it out as best I can in the manual, um, but it is more complicated than what um, is even addressed here. So if I go back to part two in the manual, it talks about a covered program. Um, and in important considerations down here at the bottom, I try to include the guidance that SAMHSA gives on this issue. Um, SAMHSA talks about a facility that holds itself out as providing alcohol or drug abuse diagnosis, treatment, referral for treatment, and that provides those services. So I've been asked what holds itself out as means. And thankfully, SAMHSA very recently, I don't see a date on it, but if you go to SAMHSA's website and look up part two guidance materials, it talks, um, or it has a, like a six page document called does part two apply to me? And it flushes out some of the details. And it says that holding yourself out as a part two program could mean any activity that would lead one to reasonably conclude that the person or the program provides substance use disorder, diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment. And it talks, it gives some examples of what that means, um, what could lead a person to reasonably conclude that you're providing those services. It talks about, of course, advertising those services, providing information to clients that are attending your programs, that you provide those services, being certified to provide those services. So if you're certified by OMAS to provide a substance use disorder service, any information that is um, given to you by a client as you're counseling them, is going to be covered under 42 CFR part two. Um, same as if you might not publicly advertise in your brochure, that was one of the questions that had come to me. Um, perhaps you don't publicly advertise that you offer substance use counseling, that you're mainly a mental health facility, but a person that comes into your facility for mental health, health mental health, counseling also starts receiving substance use disorder counseling not just telling you they have a substance use issue but you are actually counseling them or providing them a substance use disorder service it's not in your brochure but you are providing them with that service under your um, licensure as a professional or under your certification through OMAS that information is going to be part two protected. So there's still a lot of details around that. Uh, one other piece I will point out is you might have a mixed use facility. You might have a facility that provides um, mental health and substance use disorder services. The substance use disorder side of that facility would be a part two program but the whole uh, entity, like the mental health side, does not automatically become a part two program. 
you might choose to apply part two to that side if your services and your clients are your clients' needs are so intermixed that it would be hard to parse out the HIPAA and the part two protected. But essentially, for those of you who have additional questions, like the person that submitted this question does, about how does this specifically apply to my program, I really recommend you go to um, the SAMHSA's Does Part 2 Apply to Me documentation to work through that. It's been very helpful. And just keep in mind that the bottom line is if you are presenting information to your clients about counseling that you provide, if you're certified to provide, um, and you add that service to their mental health services, um, if anybody could reasonably conclude that you are providing substance use disorder diagnosis, treatment, or referral for treatment services, you need to comply with the requirements of 42 CFR Part 2. I'm going to move on from that one and go to the next submitted question. It's the um, really the last submitted question. We had some recommendations um, that came in that we'll need to consider for future versions. But as far as questions beyond what's a part two protected program, um, a question was submitted that is obviously a common question because I've heard it at the last two confidentiality trainings I've given um, to providers. And I brought it up on the screen here. It's in regard to um, question 22. It's under the disclosures between addiction providers and law enforcement. And it talks about um, part two only permitting a program to disclose information about a medical emergency to a medical professional that is administering emergent, emergency medical services. Essentially, that's the part two exception, that a part two program can share protected information with an emergency medical professional um, to the extent that professional needs the information to treat the person there on the spot. So as you all know, we're in the middle of an opiate epidemic and our law enforcement officers are permitted to carry Narcan in order to assist in an overdose situation. The submitted question and the question I've been hearing these last couple months is, what if the person that responds, unlike how this FAQ is phrased, what if the only responding person to an overdose situation, say at a residential drug and alcohol facility, is a police officer with Narcan. Do they meet the definition in that case of an emergency medical professional that needs information about the current overdose situation in order to treat the person? I, when I, this first question first came up, I went back to 42 CFR part two there is no definition of emergency medical professional in part two. When part two was implemented, originally back in the late 60s, early 70s, this opiate epidemic wasn't even on their radar. Police officers administering Narcan wasn't even on their radar. With how part two phrases this exception and the lack of a definition for emergency medical professionals, to me, it is reasonable for a program to say that if a police officer shows up with Narcan, they are permitted under part two to give that police officer information necessary to treat that person on the spot, you know, that they're overdosing, what their drug is, what the person's name is. Um, I recommend that a part two program document in their confidentiality policies that they are defining an emergency medical professional as a, to include a police officer administering a life-saving um, medication such as Narcan. Um, hopefully that address, addresses um, the extent of the questions from the person that 
submitted that one. Um, it can come up in the chat after if there's additional, but that is re my recommendation around how to deal with um, overdose situations and police officers that are there and able to administer Narcan. Those were the last of the submitted questions. Like I said, there were recommendations um, that we'll take under advisement, but in terms of submitted questions, that was it. So at this point, uh, we'll move on to, for the last uh, 20 minutes, um, any additional questions those of you on the conference uh, might have in regards to the manual. Keep in mind as you submit your questions that a lot of this is very fact specific. If it is a uh, very fact specific situation, you'll need to contact your own legal counsel. I can give you general information about how um, these laws apply um, in a general sense. I can't give you specific legal counsel. So if we can keep the questions a little bit broader and not specific to your particular organization or particular um, particular individual, um, that would be good. And Ruth, I believe you had provided people at the beginning with the method by which they can um, submit their questions. Yes, we have. So, and for those who didn't hear that, you can submit questions at the bottom of the screen by using the chat. And we've had a few come in already, so I think they're going to come up on the screen, but I'll also read them for those that are on the phone and, and can't see them. So this comes from Christine Lakomiak. It's and here's the question. I have a client at a state hospital for behavioral health treatment. The client has active warrants for their arrest and are avoiding legal involvement by continuing to go into the hospital. Can I, as a behavioral health provider, notify the police of the client's whereabouts? Ruth, I'm going to need you to start at the beginning of that. I'm sorry. No problem. The question is, I have a client at a state hospital for behavioral health treatment. The client has active warrants for their arrest and are avoiding legal involvement by continuing to go into the hospital. Can I, as a behavioral health provider, notify the police of the client's whereabouts? I'm assuming that this is, well, this could be coming up two different ways. It's hard to know since it came in in a written format. Um, the request could be coming from law enforcement. If that is the case, if the state hospital is receiving warrants, um, from law enforcement for a person that is currently in the hospital or whose whereabouts are known if they're not currently in the hospital, HIPAA, Mental Health Services, um, permits you to disclose to law enforcement in response to a warrant, the whereabouts, not, not even in response to a warrant, you can always, um, disclose regardless of whether you're being presented anything official by law enforcement or not you are always permitted to respond to a law enforcement official who is asking about the whereabouts of a suspect a fugitive um, somebody that they um, have warrants for because that is considered to be a suspect you can disclose specific information and it's outlined in the manual what information you can disclose uh, to that law enforcement officer so that they can determine the whereabouts of that person. Keep in mind, we're talking about mental health, we're talking about HIPAA and this is the state hospital. Um, so I'm assuming that's the case. You can disclose whereabouts and patient identifying information in response to an officer's request about a suspect, which would be a person with warrants, or a fugitive, um, if they're trying to hide out or if they have esca escaped police custody. Um, if you are not being contacted by law enforcement and you wish to reach out um, unsolicited essentially reach out to law enforcement about this person because you know they have active warrants. 
I don't think HIPAA provides a, an exception to the written authorization requirement in that case. If they are a threat to the health or safety of themselves, to others, to um, the staff of the hospital, um, that can be disclosed. In that case, their whereabouts can be disclosed to law enforcement so that they can lessen the threat. Um, if you're aware of another felony that has been committed and it's not um, protected or, or privileged information, I should say, that can be disclosed to law enforcement. But the way HIPAA phrases that exception, the request has to come from law enforcement. So for those of you in the criminal justice system on the phone, keep that in mind that whereas on a routine basis, the providers and the hospitals can't just reach out to you and say, hey, we know this person has warrants, this is where they're at. You can make a request if you suspect a certain person's in a hospital, in a residential unit, even in an outpatient unit, what have you, and say, um, do you know this person's whereabouts? You are permitted to say, yes, they are here, or no, they are not here, but this is the last known address we have for them. If that law enforcement official um, asserts that the person is a suspect in a crime or a fugitive, there's warrants, et cetera. Great, thank you. The second question comes from Joanna Edwards, and it reads, if a hospital emergency department has a question, concern, or issue with the way the crisis team is handling a psychiatric placement, is the hospital permitted to provide the local mental health and recovery board with identifying information regarding the patient and placement in effort to expedite the process and manage barriers to discharge? Yes, I'm going to assume this is, uh, I'm going to state that this is a mental health situation, a HIPAA covered situation, not a 42 CFR part two uh, protected situation. It's important to know that pursuant to HIPAA, and I always emphasize this in my trainings, and I tried to emphasize it in the manual, um, SAMHSA intends, intended when they drafted and intends now through various guidance that they've put out, that sharing of information between providers of treatment for treatment purposes, as it's defined under HIPAA, is intended to be wide open. In the HHS commentary, they state that. They don't want HIPAA to be a barrier to treatment, and therefore they say consults between providers, referrals between providers, sharing of information that could assist in the treatment of the person. It's all intended to be wide open under HIPAA. So when you have a hospital ER, the providers in the ER, and you have the providers sitting on the crisis team, they are permitted to share information about a client that could be helpful in that person's treatment, including identifying information, including information from their record, including specifics of their treatment. And I always say in my trainings, I know that makes people nervous. Um, it is in fact a case. I know that the hospitals sometimes have an in internal policy where they state that information can't be shared without a release. But I'm telling you what HIPAA says, HIPAA says for treatment purposes, that information can be shared without a release. I would also direct you to state law under um, Ohio Revo Revised Code section 5119.27, um, which is the OMAS statute about permitted disclosures of mental health information. It specifically talks about hospitals and providers being able to share information without the author authorization of the client for um, treatment and continuity of care purposes. The short answer is yes. Thank you. Next question is from Ginny Williams. How can we protect part two information at a substance use disorder residential facility 
if law enforcement presents to the facility with a warrant or requesting to see the individual? Yes, I've received um, questions similar to this one in the past from part two programs. It's important to note that part two, unlike HIPAA, does not let you, does not permit a part two program to disclose information to law enforcement, even if they have a warrant, if they have a search warrant, if they have an arrest warrant, um, if they're just coming as part of their investigative um, duties. A part two program is not authorized under part two to disclose anything, including that person's presence to law enforcement. The only way that information can be disclosed under part two is if there is a part two compliant court order authorizing the program to disclose that information. And you'll see in the manual that even a court order under part two has very specific requirements. It is not your standard court order. I included those uh, regulations in the back of the manual because judges often have questions about that. Um, so unless it is a court order for the disclosure of part two information, the program cannot respond. So what does the program do? Um, one thing you could possibly do is ask the client to self-present. You ask um, law enforcement to remain at your reception area or, or your waiting area. You ask the individual if they would be willing to talk to law enforcement. Of course, you cannot tell law enforcement that you're going to check with the individual. You just have to you know, say, wait right here. If the person will not self-disclose, will not present themselves to officers, the program has to tell officers that under part two, they cannot disclose anything about their clients, including their presence, and cannot um, take officers to that individual if they are there. That being said, if a law enforcement official is going to assist insist upon entry if an officer is going to insist that they enter the premises a part two program should of course not resist or block that access you should however document what occurred that you took the steps you were required to under part two to um, share with the officer that you can't disclose that information and the officer insisted upon entry and this is what occurred. Document if that would occur to protect yourself, if um, it would uh, come up that you disclosed um, information in violation of part two. Um, the other possible piece of that is if a law enforcement official is going to insist upon entry and they are not um, backing down from that after you've explained your restrictions to them. I still recommend you do not disclose information to them. You lead them to the individual and let the individual self-disclose whatever they choose to self-disclose. And then again, document what occurred. Thank you. Okay, the next one is from John Myers. And it reads, the detailed mental health history of the Florida video game shooter has been in the news lately with an unspoken assumption that the public's right to know overrides any confidentiality rights. Given the hostile atmosphere surrounding addiction and especially the opiate epidemic, it is possible that part two protections, I think it means to say, is it? Is it possible that part two protections be reduced or eliminated? And how did part two get established in the first place? Okay, so a couple of things there, and you might have to remind me of the different parts as we go through. Yeah. Um, starting with mental health history. I don't know how they are lawfully disclosing that information because HIPAA does not have an exception for a person that's deceased unless they've been deceased for 50 years. Um, it does not have any type of public right to know or 
public safety after the fact, when there's no imminent threat to safety, something about to occur, there's no after the fact disclosure of information. The only thing I can think of that would authorize the disclosure of that information is that the person's, um, the perpetrator's next of kin in that case authorized disclosure of that information. Otherwise, I don't know how a mental health professional professional that is bound by the requirements of HIPAA uh, um, was authorized to disclose that information. So know that there is no exception for a case such as that. Um, under part two, so I, I heard questions in there. Ruth, correct me if I'm mistaken. It was asking about mental health and then part two in a similar situation, correct? Yeah, so it asked about um, part two protect protections being reduced or eliminated in that situation. Um, but I think the second question is really, how did part two get established in the first place? Yeah, so part two, and one of the recommendations we received from somebody submitting questions is that we put a little bit more history about part two into the next version of this manual. I think that helps those who aren't extremely familiar with it, understand why it's different from HIPAA, why it's so protective. Um, part two, like I said, it was late 60s or very early 70s when you know the drug culture was in a dramatic rise and, and drug issues um, were, were really starting to explode. Um, the federal government wanted to encourage people not only to seek treatment, but to know that they are not going to have their family members, their employers, their next door neighbors, or anybody else find out that they are seeking that treatment. So way before HIPAA, there was this recognized need to protect the records of persons receiving drug and alcohol treatment. They pretty much locked the door and said, except in these very few instances, um, part two protected information cannot be disclosed. So that statute is much older than HIPAA, which was uh, 1996, um, got a little more practical in terms of modern day um, health systems and sharing of information um, and the needs of uh, treating providers. Please note that part two was just revised in 2017 and again in January of this year. Um, what they did in January of this year helped a little bit with disclosures, nothing that would be applicable to um, sharing with the criminal justice system, so I didn't put it in there. It's more um, between providers or with your contractors, but there is currently federal um, legislation to revise the part two statute, not the regulations that have been tinkered with here and there, but the overarching um, federal statute. Um, it's called the, the Opiate uh, Overdose Something Protection Act. So I'm sorry, I don't have the number, the exact name of it right now. Um, but it is looking to make part two similar to HIPAA in terms of disclosures for treatment purposes, payment purposes, and healthcare operations purposes. So about every week that has passed through um, the US House, it is in the Senate right now. Just if you're a part two provider, you work with a part two provider regularly, um, keep an eye out to see if those regulations are relaxed a bit in the coming months or year, I would say. Great, thank you for that, Christina. So that was the last submitted question from the chat box, and it is exactly 12 o'clock, so that, that's pretty miraculous, the way that worked out in timing. Um, thank you, Christina, for your time, for answering these questions. I think that, um, is it fair enough to say that if folks want to submit questions after they think about that, they can do that through the criminal justice CCOE and we can share those with you. Um, and perhaps we can respond to those at a later date. And there's a question that's come up. Go ahead. There's a question. 
you first. I put in the reminder that um, your fact specific situation should be directed to your legal counsel. Keep this, um, any questions you submit after this webinar at a more general application level. Right. And in fact, maybe it's probably fairer to say that we would try to answer those or incorporate those if they're pertinent into the next revision of the manual. The other question that's come up is whether or not you're willing to share the slides and if we can share those when we share the recording link. Can we Absolutely. do that? Yep. Okay. So the slides as well as a link to the recorded webinar will be provided at a future date to everybody who participated today. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Christina. Thank you everybody for your time and we're going to sign off. Thank you everyone.